So this week's uh, session is called The Arts of Rupture and we're looking at the role of aesthetics in politics, the relationship between aesthetics uh, and, and politics. And already there are two things over there. One is the, is the role of the arts, the role of things like music, of image, of painting, of photography, of film, uh, etc., of, of graffiti, um, of, of rhythms, of a range of different uh, forms of art and the role they have played historically in, uh, in the emergence of new political formations, uh, etc. And the other is the broader realm of aesthetics. Uh, aesthetics is much broader than, than simply, uh, than simply the, the realm of the arts. Uh, aesthetics is about that which is sensible, that which can be sensed, which can be felt, which can be experienced, uh, etc. And uh, the, the, the question is, what do unruly political actions or modalities of action do in relation to that which is uh, which is sensible, which uh, uh, you know, which which provides a landscape for for our experience of politics, and therefore the conditions of our political subjectivity. Uh, last week we looked at technology, you know, in, through a very similar kind of lens. What are the technological conditions? under which forms of political subjectivity come into being or are negotiated, uh, etc. Now we're going to shift from technology as a way of looking at those conditions to aesthetics, this broader realm of aesthetics. Uh, and we'll be using art forms as a way of opening out uh, those questions. Uh, in the session itself, we're going to look at a few examples and with each of those examples, we're going to open up uh, different elements uh, in this uh, in this field. Uh, theoretically, we're going to look at uh, Judith Butler's uh, theory of performativity uh, and look at, at gender the, and aesthetics of of uh, of gender and the ruptures that are are, are possible or created uh, in the narrative of gender, in the processes through which gender uh, becomes an apparent reality. Uh, in our world. Uh, and the other main theoretical uh, focus is that of Jacques uh, Rancière, uh, who's, uh, who, which is where we're drawing this idea of the sensible and uh, his notion of uh, regimes of, of, uh, of aesthetics, um, etc. Those, those are the two main theoretical uh, focuses of, uh, of today's session. We're also going to get into uh, a few moments in the history of, of music. Uh, and look at the formation of identity, the, uh, the ways in which we escape identity uh, and the conditions under which musical forms become vehicles for political discourse and for political uh, subjectivity. We're also going to look briefly at uh, Augusto Boal's uh, practice of the of, uh, theatre of the oppressed. So we're going to look at, uh, at forum theatre, we're going to look at invisible theatre uh, etc. As, uh, as a very crucial, uh, a, a crucial intervention into the use of theatre uh, as a political mechanism, uh, not simply political theatre, but looking at uh, the process of theatre uh, as a way in which political subjectivity uh, is, uh, is generated. So I imagine that uh, you all are experiencing one of the finest moments of, uh, of Brighton right now where the, the dark, grey, cold of the winter is slowly dissipating and the, the daffodils are out and the crocai or the crocuses are, 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 are blooming and you've got your cherry blossoms and everyone's wearing a little less clothes and everyone's a little more chipper and willing to go out much more. Uh, the experience of the city uh, I imagine is uh, changing, or at least I hope it's, uh, it's changing. And every year there is a, a change, a shift in mood in the way we experience ourselves, our cities, our, our socialities, depending on, on what the city looks like and what the city feels like, the way you sense the city. Um, and for those of you who haven't yet had the experience of a Brighton summer, it's spectacular, it's going to be 
warm and it's going to be beautiful and it's going to be erotic and flirtatious and all that kind of stuff and I wish I was there for that. Now in the summer of 2013, uh, we had a very peculiar summer. It was one of the hottest, uh, hottest summers. Uh, and the heat and the humidity was, was building and usually that's something really welcome and, and enjoyable in a city like, like Brighton. The sea suddenly becomes uh, available for a nice swim, uh, etc. But in 2013, this was the time when austerity measures were being rolled out you know, in a very big way. Uh, and the council had announced that it was going to uh, cut the additional pay that, uh, that, you know, that people at the lowest in the pecking order, that is uh, your bin collectors, people who collect your garbage, your, your refuse, who do your recycling, etc. That they would, their, essentially that their, uh, you know, their salaries would, uh, would take a hit uh, and as much as £4,000 uh, per year, which for someone who's earning nineteen thousand pounds a year is a huge, uh, a huge cut, and the refuse collectors decided to go on strike. And this strike went on for a few weeks. It went on, and slowly, slowly, the streets of Brighton started filling up with bags, and with the heat and and the humidity, and the seagulls attacking those, those, uh, those plastic bags strewn all across the city. The stench of, of our rubbish, of, of the stuff that we've consumed and thrown away. Uh, you know, suddenly our streets were full of, of things which are, 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 are left in, uh, in, in, are thrown safely in, in the garbage. So you've got your used condoms, your, your sanitary pads, the stuff that we keep hidden. That, those elements of our consumption that are that are that are in the, in the private kind of realm suddenly uh, you know the, the way in which the city was experienced was completely different because uh, our consumption was suddenly so visible so you know it, it could be smelled it could be seen it could be it could be felt all around you you know the the the, the usually welcome summer breeze wafting into your into your kitchen with the smell of of rotten uh, rotten meat and rotten fish, uh, etc. This was an intervention into the sensible, into the way in which we experienced our city, the way in which we were suddenly forced to acknowledge our consumption, the amount of our consumption, the amount of waste that we, uh, that we, uh, that we produce. Uh, the various elements of our of our lives, the stuff that we keep hidden in the bedroom, was suddenly out on the on the streets. So this was a moment where uh, where our relationship with our city and our relationship with capitalism was suddenly made visible on a regular basis. Uh, you know, the, your your bin collectors come really early in the morning. They work late at night and very early in the morning to keep our consumption invisible to us in the name of, of convenience, etc. The, the fact that these people who make the city livable, that allow us to have a certain ethical sense of living, you know, we do our recycling and feel uh, really great about it, etc. And that Brighton is, is a green city with a green council, etc. All that kind of uh, hides, you know, works tirelessly to hide the truth of capitalism. In, at, at two levels. One, at the level of our consumption, the nature and the extent of our, uh, our consumption. Where does all that waste go? What happens to it? Where are the waste dumps, etc.? Where, where, what are the conditions under which these things are being, are being produced, consumed and then, uh, uh, and then, then put out uh, in, into the back into the world? At one level, that. And second, the very hierarchy through which austerity, uh, austerity functions. The way in which it is always the poorest, always the, the people at the bottom that face the, uh, the, the greatest violence of, uh, of austerity, of the political economy, etc. All that was suddenly brought into, forced into our faces in the realm of the sensible, in the realm of what is intelligible. And there's another element over there. This to me was one of the greatest moments of, uh, of art where each and every citizen, each and every person living in the city was forced to become an artist, to become, to participate in, in the creation of this, of, this, uh, of this experience 
where the truth of capitalism was, uh, was suddenly uh, tangible, was suddenly sensible. Now, when Rancière is talking about aesthetics, or when we're talking about, uh, about politics and aesthetics, this is precisely what we're talking about. What is it that can be sensed? What are the mechanisms through which the truth of, of politics, the truth of power, is constantly hidden from us? is constantly hidden from the gaze and disallowed from entering the uh, entering political subjectivity. What are the conditions under which art creates ruptures in our aesthetic sensibilities, in our experience uh, of the world? So when we look at uh, the role of art in politics, the question is what are the conditions under which ruptures are created, whereby what we have to acknowledge about our complicity with, uh, with the political economy, our complicity with capitalism, right, is thrown in our faces. We are forced to acknowledge our own position uh, in that and then generate a question of, of political uh, subjectivity. How then does one act? There's another example from, uh, from protests in the UK that I, that, uh, that I want to bring up here. Uh, and this is from the absolutely beautiful city of Edinburgh when the uh, anti g protests took place, I think, in 2004. Uh, now, Edinburgh is an incredibly, incredibly beautiful old city with these really old buildings and, you know, there's, the, there's Arthur's Seat and there's these hills which kind of provide the city with a sense of gravitas and, and, uh, and grandeur and, and history, etc. Now, when the G8 protests were going to happen, the, uh, you know, the, the council was quite, uh, quite clever in, in thinking that, well, this city which, the aesthetic of which is a form of capital because, you know, the tourist industry is, is one of the main sources of income uh, in, uh, in Edinburgh, uh, that this form of capital had to be protected. Uh, they were quite clear that, uh, that there would be attempts at graffiti and at painting slogans on these beautiful buildings, etc. And they did something quite clever. They boarded up uh, most of the, the buildings in the, in the city centre uh, so that people could do, uh, could do graffiti, could take over the city aesthetically, could provide those ruptures, uh, you know, pointing to the banking industry, etc. Uh, and and that's, what, that's what happened. There was a sudden inflow of a very large number of of people, extremely colourful people, the clowns, the, the artists, everyone from all around Europe and elsewhere uh, land up over there, uh, as used to happen with all uh, anti g protests. Uh, and yes, there was amazing political graffiti and commentary on, on the streets of that city, and that city, city was transformed. Uh, of course, a week after, after the g protests, and this was of course uh, interrupted by the London bombings, which uh, you know, suddenly diverted all the attention away from uh, from the G8 uh, summit itself. Um, the city was back to exactly where it was before. It was back to the same old sensibility, the same old aesthetic, uh, etc. So there's a, a certain um, awareness within the state about the significance of uh, of exactly uh, the the relationship between uh, aesthetics and politics. I'm given to believe that there's a gender takeover being planned uh, in, in IDS next week or, or the week after. Uh, and that is something which is, you know, with, you know what, what exactly is being planned? What, how the, what are the ways in which the space is being taken over? What are the, uh, what are the intentions of, of the takeover? In what ways can, can we aesthetically Create, a, a create an awareness, create an intelligibility of the way in which gender functions within that space, within uh, the institute, uh, etc. And even when you are thinking about your, un, your own unruly uh, ruptures, your own uh, you know, collective action that you, that you all are planning, if you are looking at uh, taking over spaces, what are the aesthetic elements of the way in which that space is experienced, the ways in which uh, ideologies of power articulate uh, in in that uh, in that aesthetic. What are the ruptures that are, are possible 
in that. So th that would be an example of the way in which unruly political action could or must engage with, uh, with, uh, with the aesthetics. One of the most exciting things about returning to Delhi after all these years is my experience of gender uh, in this city. Uh, very often, you know, in a public space, when I'm in a public space, especially when I don't have uh, elaborate facial hair, uh, I'm stopped by people on the streets and asked, are you a brother or a sister? And usually these are, uh, very often these are children who are, who are able to express their curiosity because Something about the nose ring and the bangles and the hair uh, makes this body unintelligible in terms of, uh, of gender. And there's a certain joy in, uh, in feeling that you're creating some kind of a rupture, some kind of thinking about, about gender. And my usual response is, are there, are, is brother and sister the only two options that you're going to, uh, going to give me? And you know, then that opens up questions about gender itself. Now, we're going to look a little bit at uh, uh, Judith Butler's theory of performativity. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to go back a little bit uh, within Butler itself. Her discussion on, uh, on Freud um, and Freud's understanding of gender and, and, uh, and sex. Um, for Freud, what it means to be a man, uh, and, and this is a part of the developmental process of of the child, you know, children have a certain ambiguity around desire and, and gender, etc. And then the process of being formed, but when they are formed, what it means to be a man is that which is, uh, which desires a woman and not a man. Similarly, a woman is that who desires a man and not a woman. Now, what this means is that there is a certain disavowal of the, that ambiguity of gender, of, of desire that existed before. It is not that until a certain age, I, you know, I, I, you know, had desires for the same sex, etc. And we used to play around and now that I've grown up, that doesn't happen anymore. It is the complete wiping out of, uh, of, of those desires. It's the impossibility of mourning, of nostalgia, of remembering the time that was. It is the disavowal of that, of that element of oneself uh, completely. Now, this is the structure of melancholia. Uh, and this is what, what Judith Butler picks up. She says that where, uh, where there cannot be a mourning or, a, uh, or the articulation of a loss, that thing which is, which is lost right, becomes very central to the sense of, uh, of self. Uh, it writes itself into the very core of one's, of one's being. Okay? And therefore to be, a, uh, to be a man implies a complete, uh, on, on the one hand, a complete denial that one had desires for other male bodies and the writing in of that desire into the very core of what it means to be a man. And therefore there has to be a continuous denial a continuous denial of that possibility and that is required of us every day on, on an everyday kind of basis therefore we have to perform every day as though we were always already heterosexual and, uh, and cisgender uh, we were always already either men or, uh, or women right? that is the structure of gender uh, according, to, according to Butler and that is why we are constantly called upon to perform uh, our gender roles uh, etc. So that, that opens up the question of if we were already men and women, why is it necessary for us to constantly perform that? What is that disjuncture or that rupture that is created by the image of, as Nivedita Menon uh, says, of, uh, of a man with a beard wearing a skirt? What is that rupture that is created? Why is that so anxiety creating? Why is uh, the transgression of gender? in terms of aesthetics so uh, you know so so uh, uh, power laden etc that it must be explained in one way or the other there must be either a medical discourse to explain it or uh, you know or a pathological one or a criminal one uh, etc et why does that why is that necessary because gender is performativity now if we look at 
uh, what, what's called a second wave feminism, where there was the distinction made between uh, sex on the one hand, sex as being in the realm of the natural, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the biological, Right? As compared to gender, which is a social construction atop this, uh, you know, this natural biological uh, reality. Right? If we look at uh, that kind of framework, there is sex and then there is gender. What Butler is doing is she is inverting this entire postulate, inverting this entire understanding, and, say, and saying that gender is prior to sex. Right? So that's the entire process of performing, constantly performing gender creates that effect of there being an essence which is sex. So it's not that gender is built on top of sex but rather that sex becomes intelligible and tangible because of continuous gender, uh, gender performance. So we look at the role of aesthetics in this. It's a question of intelligibility. So one's gender performance as either male or female, unproblematically male or female, is based on that ability to be intelligible as those bodies. The minute you have a rupture in that, in that uh, continuous performance, that opens up the very question of what is gender. Is it not ideological? Is it not political? Is it not the case that we live in a time of compulsory heterosexuality? Heterosexuality is not, uh, is not natural, but rather compulsory. And this is the argument of uh, Nevedita Menon. Uh, there's one more important addition to be made to this narrative of gender being performative and uh, maintained through, uh, through aesthetic performance. Uh, and for that I want to give another quick example. Of the first time I moved to the, to the UK, uh, I once wore a sari and went out uh, on the streets of London. And the kinds of responses I got from people around me was to call me a Hare Krishna. Right? It was as though because of the color of my skin, the possibility of me, me being queer or queer-bodied was, was, uh, was denied to me. Here we see that the, the interplay of race and, uh, and gender and class, etc. So rather than thinking of intersectionality as being about you know, gender, comma, race, comma, class, the minute we start thinking in terms of aesthetics and aesthetic rupture, these different elements can be seen to constitute each other, not separable from each other. Right? So as compared to an identity politics, if we are focused on aesthetics, politics and rupture, we can look at a, a more nuanced kind of understanding of intersectionality, a more nuanced kind of understanding of intelligibility and therefore access to, uh, to spaces, to rights, to power, uh, etc. So when we're talking about performativity, we should not restrict it simply to the question of gender, but similarly these other elements that populate our political subjectivity, our political landscapes. There's a distinction that can and often is made between uh, popular culture and and political art sort of thing, where political art is, or political theatre, political cinema, political music is, uh, is seen as that which has an explicit ideological underpinning, uh, a particular kind of audience, it has a certain, its role is a certain kind of affect, a certain kind of dialogue happening uh, between people who are uh, politically inclined in some ways, you know, the art house uh, cinema. Uh, etc. As compared to popular culture which is typically spoken of as being apolitical, being purely entertainment, etc. But if we're looking at aesthetics as an approach to the relationship between art and politics, this distinction kind of uh, uh, is, is a bit untenable. Because if every articulation of aesthetics is already relating in one way or the other to that which is sensible. Either it's reinforcing certain, uh, certain notions or certain, uh, certain aesthetic regimes or uh, creating ruptures in them, etc, etc. So, kind of the, the truism that every, everything is political, uh, I think 
becomes a, becomes a more nuanced kind of, uh, of possibility or a nuanced kind of approach to the question of the role of art in, uh, in politics. Um, let me very briefly take you through uh, a very, very rough sketch of the history of, of Hindi cinema. <coughs> uh, and and you know, starting quite, quite late, starting in the, in the post-independence kind of uh, period where in the 50s you see several films that are relating either to, to the city, you know, either to, to the city of Bombay uh, in, in particular where you're, you're seeing a sudden migration of people, there's a new sense of political economy at the same time there is uh, there's the you know the recognition of urban poverty uh, etc uh, and on the other hand you have the, the film about uh, about the rural hinterland you have the agricultural film the, where the where the farmer is the is the is the is the protagonist of, or that's the kind of context in both these there is a, a very strong narrative of nation building of a certain idea of the of the nation, and that's where the the you know the the farmer and the soldier and the uh, and and the urban poor kind of kind of come together. Very strong, explicit narratives within what can be called uh, popular culture. You know, extremely popular films. Uh, whether we're talking about Mother India or we're talking about uh, you know Raj Kapoor's uh, films in in the city, uh, like Avara, Sri Chasubis, uh, etc. Um, and and over a period of time, when we by the time we get to the to the seventies, we have a new formation that uh, that that comes up. We have the emergence of of the superstar, the larger than life. The you know, and the the perfect example is uh, Amitabh Bachchan, where you know this the, he's either a working he's a working class hero. It's about the rise of the of the uh, the, the ability of the individual to rise from the you know. Uh, from from the streets to a position of power, uh, narratives of, of of law and lawlessness and all sorts of things. But what emerges is the superstar, the figure of the larger than life, greater than uh, you know. And, and I remember growing up the in you know the cities uh, of Bangalore and Delhi would be uh, peppered with these, <coughs> or rather punctured with these huge seventy foot, eighty foot uh, kind of. Uh, you know, cutouts of uh, of of Amitabh Bachchan and, and other uh, kinds of heroes, and it's at that point that we have the emergence of what what's called the second wave of of Hindi cinema, where the uh, where, where you know where where the the popular cinema has become so centered around the narrative of this superhero sort of thing. Suddenly, you have uh, films by Rishikesh Mukherjee and uh, and other such, which is again about everyday people. It's about it's comedies. It's it's sweet stuff. It's you know it's it's uh, it's bittersweet. It's poignant um, uh, kind of stuff. And out of that emerges a uh, uh, or rather around the same time emerges the, uh, the the political cinema, the, the properly political cinema, where like Albert Pinto ko gussa kyu aata hai, uh, etc. Again, this is this is the uh, you know this is the the working class in. Uh, in in the city, and this is there's no like you know dancing around trees etc. There is uh, there is music, but these are very very serious, heavy uh, kinds of films uh, which are typically watched on television rather than uh, rather than on the in cinema etc. And and then in the eighties you have you know the the uh, the popular cinema becomes actually really boring. There's no sense of a political commentary uh, happening really. Uh, and then, as you know, we, we go along, and in the in the 2000s, suddenly there's the the return of the political into the into the popular. There's a, a re enmeshing. So, for instance, uh, a recent film, uh, Heather, uh, which is one of the first, you know, properly, uh, I don't know, in, in some ways, more nuanced films about about Kashmir. It's the it's the retelling of uh, of the story of Hamlet. Uh, it's an interpretation of Hamlet, but set in in Kashmir. Now, this is neither political cinema in the in that old sense, nor is it uh, a popular cinema. So you have the the you know the the flow of these two different impulses or uh, approaches to cinema itself in in this new in this new uh, kind of form. 
So which of these do we consider as political cinema? Which of these do we uh, consider as popular cinema? That's become impossible to, uh, to really uh, distinguish. So if political art is not uh, to be seen as a distinct category uh, which is available for our analysis, etc. And that we're saying that politics is everything. Uh, how do we address the question of the relationship between art and, and politics? And there's a, a series of ways that we're going to, uh, or series of questions that we're going to open. The first is the another truism that art is experienced uh, in a diverse set of ways, depending on who you are, how you're watching it, where you're where you're experiencing, where you're hearing a song, what are the conditions under which you're, you're doing that, uh, etc. So, for instance, uh, you know, Madhuri Dikshit was this, is this uh, Hindi film actress who, uh, who you know, who, who ex did this ex these extremely beautiful, erotic, sexual, fun dances in the, uh, in the, in the 90s. And a lot of the analysis of that has been about uh, oh, it's the objectification of women, um, etc. Et and you know these songs where she's thrusting her breasts and uh, all that kind of stuff. And I remember as a child watching that and being absolutely fascinated by it and being erotically charged. But I wanted to be Madhuri. I related to to that figure, not the the male gaze that was being that is being presumed in uh, in the feminist analysis as as projected upon the. Uh, the putative male body uh, sort of thing. So right from then it was, it was quite clear that one experiences these things in a diverse series of ways and that allows for the appropriation of all sorts of different objects uh, in subversive ways, in ways that were not imagined before, uh, in, you know, in ways that open up new, uh, new uh, ruptures in, in aesthetics of that object itself. Uh, one of the exciting uh, projects, and it's quite old by now. Uh, it's called it was called Queering Bollywood, uh, where uh, Namita Malhotra, uh, an activist and filmmaker, picked up, you know, trolled through you know decades and decades of Hindi cinema, and pulled out uh, the you know the those moments which were experienced as queer, those moments that are possible to be read as queer, and especially in terms of uh, male bonding and male eroticism, uh, etc. So, you know, to be able to see the film like Shole, which is uh, the Hindi film tribute to Sergio Leone, uh, you know, it's, it's like a, a, a Western based in, uh, in India, and it's a narrative of, of this immense friendship, this really strong friendship between these two, uh, these two men. Um, to be able to read that as as queer, to be able to think about the ways in which queer folk uh, at that time, in the late 70s, may have watched that film, but also looking at, uh, you know, humor around sexual desire, uh, non-normative sexual desire, etc. And putting that together and being able to splice that together as, you know, giving us the history of Hindi cinema as a queer narrative, as a narrative of queer cinema, not... So when we're talking about queer cinema, we're not simply talking about those films which have explicitly uh, gay or lesbian characters and it's about their uh, you know their struggles etc but being able to see the homoerotic in uh, what is considered as populism which is considered as normative uh, kind of kind of narrative so that ability to uh, to appropriate to reclaim and to to uh, reformulate the aesthetics of that given object is something that is part and parcel of the question of art and, and politics um, itself. And of course it takes complex forms, the entire thing of, of appropriation. So the controversy around Miley Cyrus uh, twerking at whatever, you know, on, on stage, uh, that, you know, that, that kind of stuff where uh, uh, marginalized cultures are being appropriated, fetishized and then reformulated uh, within the, you know, the industry, so to say. So that, that is also an, a, a part of this. But the, the key conceptual and theoretical point uh, is that, um, that the political content of art is not contained within that object, is not contained within the film or within the painting or within the song. 
It's in relation between every articulation of that object of art and the conditions in which it is articulated. The ways in which it is, uh, it is experienced and uh, recast as, as a political uh, object. So that would be one of, one of the primary uh, approaches to this question of art and, and politics. The second approach to uh, the relationship between art and, and politics would be to look at, uh, at conditions for uh, you know, the, the political economic conditions under which uh, art, is, uh, art is made. And for this I want to refer to uh, uh, the story of the, the emergence of reggae, or rather the, the movement from ska to rocksteady uh, to reggae. This is, this is the story told uh, very nicely uh, in the Heathcote article, which is on your reading list. Um, ska was, you know, it originates in the, in the 1950s, in uh, Jamaican shanty towns, uh, and uh, it has a very frenetic kind of kind of beat, and this is the the realm of the of the dance halls. In in shanty towns, is an area where young people come and hang out, and there's music that are being being sung and being listened to and responded to, uh, etc. And and the beat is extremely extremely frenetic, and uh, the, the 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 lyrics are angry and political and uh, a commentary on. Uh, on you know on disenfranchisement and what is happening etc. Uh, and it's also the time where you have the emergence of the root boy, uh, root boy image. And there's a certain aggressiveness which surrounds these dance halls where ska is uh, is emerging. Hitko tells us of one particular summer which was partic you know particularly hot. And this was a time where there was uh, you know a, a particularly difficult time for the working class uh, in in Jamaican uh, shanty towns. Uh, and uh, a rise of, of anger vis-a-vis -vis disenfranchisement uh, and the heat and the frenetic beat and everything and there's uh, very often there's this eruption of, uh, of violence of uh, you know of scuffles that, and that leads to uh, to violence uh, etc and it has this moment where uh, several of the owners of these these dance halls get together uh, have conversation with uh, with musicians. I'm sure it's a more complicated uh, story, uh, and decide that what is important is to reduce the pace. One thing that they could do to uh, to deal with this problem of aggression is to reduce the the the, the, the pace of the rhythm uh, of uh, of these songs. And there you have the emergence of rock steady, where the tempo has suddenly fallen to uh, you know to one third of the pace. It's the same rhythm, but at a much uh, lower pace. And from rock steady, because there is much more space in that slower rhythm, you have the emergence of, of reggae, where it is you know the, the main uh, the main uh, difference over there being that there's a, there's the possibility of actually spelling out political narrative experience of disenfranchisement in such a way for this music to become a vehicle. Of that, uh, of that political impulse, and thereby you have the emergence of reggae, which is the you know continues to be the most uh, popular political music, uh, 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 the most amazing form where politics and popular uh, kind of uh, kind of merge. Now, the you know what what do we get from this story? We're, we're looking at political economic conditions. We're looking at political discourse. We're looking at the weather. We're looking at at the you know the the, the establishments, the relationship between the musicians and the establishments, etc. These are the conditions under which you have the emergence of a particular art form which becomes a vehicle for political conversation, for protest, for uh, mobilization, uh, etc. So that's another, another approach to this question of, of art and uh, the relationship between art and politics is to look at those those conditions, those those nuances, the you know, kind of with an ethnographic kind of uh, uh, specificity, to look at conditions under which art forms uh, articulate and rearticulate. Another interesting story to look at in this context would be the, the story of Bhangra in, uh, in, in Britain or Bhangra uh, which 
became a, a kind of space where various uh, people of South Asian origin, various youngsters of South Asian uh, origins uh, were able to find some kind of similarity with each other, some kind of shared space. Um, the actual story that I want to share is the, is the coming together of Bhangra uh, with, uh, with, with reggae in, uh, in Britain. Now, and this is a story of the, the relationship between African and African Caribbean uh, communities in Britain and South Asian communities uh, in, in Britain. Uh, we're looking at, uh, let's start a little earlier, let's look at the, the 1980s where there is the, <coughs> the attempt to create a, a larger notion of black uh, which brings together the experiences of the various, various uh, uh, migrant communities, communities that have come in the post-colonial period uh, to, uh, to Britain. Uh, and it's in the 80s that there's a, a certain sharing of the, the, the space of the shop floor uh, and the emergence of the trade union as a space for the articulation of this new identity because that's the only space. Otherwise, these different communities are separated from each other, kind of ghettoized, not exactly having the space to interact with each other except as you know, completely different uh, from each other, a relationship of self, other sort of thing and the usual divide and rule kind of uh, phenomenon. Uh, it's the trade union that becomes the space, the shop floor becomes space for the coming together and the ability to imagine a black identity that embraces all these different uh, uh, ethnic backgrounds. Uh, and of course in the late 80s we have, uh, we have uh, the rise of Thatcher and we have the absolute decimation of the trade union as a viable political medium, as a viable political uh, uh, mechanism uh, of participation of these different uh, different communities, uh, and so you have uh, you know a return to a kind of separation between these until we have Apache Indian, uh, a boy from Birmingham who uh, who grew up listening to reggae and uh, you know and and bhangra. He emerges as the person who collaborates with Maxi Priest, who at that point was the biggest uh, British uh, uh, reggae star, and they start a collaboration. Uh, they they start singing together, and suddenly it's not you know it's not the idea of fusion music where there's the Indian playing the tabla and singing some raga, and then there's someone playing the piano or something like that, but rather you know where where Maxi Priest is heard singing. Uh, singing in Punjabi, singing the Bhangra part of these collaborations while Apache is singing in Patwa, is, is, uh, is, is doing reggae. So there's this, uh, you know, this new form which comes, uh, comes up which is uh, Bhangra Mafia, which is the bringing together of these, of these different, uh, different traditions, these different histories. Now the important thing in this story, and this is taken from, uh, uh, from the article by Les Back, which is also in your, in your reading list, uh, which, which he's calling about an intermezzo culture. It's, it's the creation of a space where there is uh, an emergence of a third kind of identity, a third kind of formation, which is not the combination of this and this, but something else. If you remember, last week we spoke about, about the rhizome as, uh, as a way of thinking about, about human subjectivity, etc. And this is kind of an application of that same idea of the rhizome, of the rhizomatic, as the condition for the emergence of, uh, of a political subjectivity. And of course, uh, Apache has gone on and done some fascinating collaborations with other musicians in different parts of the world, uh, with Tamil stars in, in Malaysia, with, uh, you know, just traveled around and, and you know, it, it's, a, it's a different kind of, uh, of approach, which is not simply about uh, the coming together of forms of music, but the creation of possibilities of new political subjectivities. Simply because that space is, is created and those kids are going to come there and those kids are going to come there and they're going to hang out and they're going to meet and they're going to have all sorts of congress uh, it, at, at the discotheque or, or, or whatever. So the kinds of spaces that art can, can create for experience are not, you know, can be uh, such that they're not closed off and addressing one identity and reaffirming one identity in that kind of regressive kind of uh, kind of way, but rather a, a way in which identity itself is is suspended and something else can be created, something else can uh, uh, can come up. Excellent.
So to pull these different strands or different approaches uh, together, uh, uh, the question of how we approach uh, the relationship between art and politics cannot be exhausted with an analysis of the statement or the content uh, in, a, in, a given piece of, uh, in, a, in a given piece of art as intended by the author. It's important to look at the conditions under which that object came to be the conditions under which it is experienced, the conditions under which circulates, and the ways in which it can be appropriated into different political impulses uh, and political subjectivities. So now I want to look at uh, an instance where art has been used as a uh, as a method in the process of developing politics. Uh, it's not exactly unruly because uh, it has quite a long tradition and quite uh, well thought out practices that go into it, but what I'm uh, referring to here is uh, Augusto Boal's work on the theatre of the, of the oppressed. Um, theatre of the oppressed has been used by uh, people's movements, by new social movements in the Latin American sense. Uh, for a very long time uh, and also is extremely popular uh, amongst movements uh, in, in India, in rural India uh, and in several parts of the African uh, continent. Uh, so there's quite a large community of practitioners and different ways in which Augusto Boal's uh, theory uh, of theatre and the exercises and games etc. that he has come up with uh, have been uh, have been adapted and used. So it's it's quite a plethora of uh, of very diverse ways in which uh, some of these ideas have been have been used. Um, I'm going to give you a, a, a quick description of some of the features of uh, of um, uh, the theatre of the oppressed uh, and use that to open up some questions about uh, art as political process. Uh, explicitly recognizing art as a political process. So using art as a political uh, process. Uh, Augusto Boal, in, in, a, in a simple kind of uh, description, brings together uh, the Brechtian ideas around theatre, uh, Bertolt Brecht's ideas of theatre, uh, with Paulo Freire's uh, work on critical pedagogy, and pedagogy of the oppressed. So he kind of brings those two uh, traditions or, or ways of thinking about politics uh, together. And from that evolves uh, um, theatre of, of the oppressed. Um, the significant thing that he pulls from Brecht is the dissolution of that boundary between the stage and the audience. Uh, you know, as compared to a more traditional uh, Western notion of theatre, where there is uh, where there is a stage which is somehow sovereign, which uh, contains the narrative and and displaced, and then you have something of an of a mute audience, or an audience that is simply uh, simply kind of watching. Uh, as compared to that, what Brecht does is uh, dissolves that distinction and lets uh, lets the performance itself flow between these two uh, these two domains, uh, whereby the play the play the drama that is being watched is not simply on stage but also in the audience, and the audience is not simply watching but is also feeding back onto what is happening uh, on the stage. Um, so that is, what, that is one element of uh, theatre of the oppressed. Uh, the other is uh, Paolo Freire's idea of uh, pedagogy as a very significant element in the development of political consciousness and that relates to the question of, of language, to the, to the question of uh, epistemology, of, of what, what, what are the idioms through which a political discourse a political consciousness uh, is, is developed, an understanding of our conditions of, of being. For Paolo Freire, pedagogy is a, is a crucial uh, element of 
of that, and it stems back to his you know his reading of of, of Gramsci and uh, of hegemony, etc. Uh, so what uh, Boal does is bring these two together and come up with what at that point was quite a unique kind of uh, idea of what what the role of theatre could be in uh, in politics. Um, Another significant thing to understand about uh, Boal is his, uh, is the way in which he approaches the relationship between image and body and and words. Uh, Im uh, sorry, image and body are kind of together. There's sound and then there's words. And there's what he says that in politics there's a certain hierarchy. In governmentality there's a certain hierarchy where uh, where uh, the realm of words is uh, is is kind of superior. To, to everything else uh, and that's partly because the realm of words is controlled by those in power at the top of the political hierarchy etc and we see something similar to that in terms of uh, you know our obsession with policy and with law and with the written word uh, etc and there's, there's longer histories of uh, of uh, hermeneutics and interpretation as uh, as the the point of interaction between the sovereign word and the experiences of uh, of people. Now, what Boal does with uh, in in theatre of the oppressed is uh, is invert that entire hierarchy, and so a lot of the exercises have a lot more to do with the way in which we use our bodies, the way in which we experience our bodies and express through our bodies, uh, and through sounds which is which are which are beyond the realm of simply language, right? And then there is there is words. So if you look at the exercises. Uh, or rather the, the games that one goes through in order to come to a point of doing a forum uh, of doing a forum uh, which is kind of the end point of forum of the forum theater process uh, first you work without uh, without sound you work simply with the body then then you move on to to making sounds and then you bring in uh, bring in language then you bring in that kind of communication so there isn't uh, you know, firstly you read the script and then you do a play reading and then you know uh, it's an interpretation of the of the script etc. There's a certain inversion because the language of the oppressed uh, stems from from the body and you know manual labor and the experience of embodiment uh, etc. So that's uh, that's the second important uh, element that you need to keep in mind in uh, in understanding uh, theater of the uh, of the oppressed. So let me describe to you uh, the, the forum theatre process uh, very briefly, in a very uh, simple kind of way, so you understand the logic of it. Uh, we start with, bring, you know, it, it, it's, it's work within community, it's community, uh, community theatre. And we, we start with getting people to sit together in, in, in groups or in small groups or just two people uh, telling each other stories of of oppression and then you go through a process through which uh, the, the person you've told the story to represents your story to uh, to uh, to the larger group or to other people and you try and weave together different experiences of uh, of oppression uh, in order to somehow settle on some kind of a, a narrative some kind of a story which contains as many elements of oppression uh, as as possible, and you're doing this, like I said, through using the body, through using sound, and then you come up with uh, with uh, with a narrative uh, of sorts, uh, and you develop uh, develop a, a short a short play, a short skit, which is then brought to a forum, which is to say, you are performing uh, typically with people around you. Uh, you're performing to the community from where whence the these narratives uh, arise. So it's it's people from the community acting out a story uh, for other people in the community, and the 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 entire narrative of uh, of an experience of oppression uh, will be will be acted out, uh, and then it will be acted out again. And this second time around, uh, anyone in the audience can uh, can stop the play by 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 clapping and take the place of the oppressed um, in you know and and respond differently so if if you're, it's a situation of police harassment or something like that uh, someone else in the community will come up and uh, and act out take the place of the person doing the role of the oppressed 
and act out the, uh, you know, another strategy. What is another strategy that one could have in order to respond to a certain kind of moment? And then someone else will will step in and complicate the figure more. So you, you kind of get a map of the possibilities of political strategy. Uh, and thereby a consciousness of the conditions under which oppression uh, is engaged with, is dealt with strategies, uh, political strategies of dealing with, uh, with structural oppression, uh, etc. Now, uh, at, at the IDS, one of the things that, uh, that we did as part of the sexuality program was to try and develop uh, forum theatre and other forms of, uh, of theatre of the oppressed and other forms of community theatre into a, a, re a research methodology. So, you know, it's quite similar, it's about the consciousness. Research is quite similar to uh, the process of development of a, of a political consciousness. And if you're looking at action research and participatory research, uh, etc., we, we were trying to develop it specifically in the context of uh, sexuality. And we did a couple of experiments diverting from the strict notions of uh, forum theatre. So, for instance, uh, you know, people could stop the play. Uh, and replace not simply the oppressed, but also the oppressor. Because there's, you know, over a period of time we recognize that uh, relationships of oppression are quite complex. There are other relationships that, that uh, go into those, those moments of, uh, of conflict between, uh, between people. Uh, and, and of course, also to be able to map out the various ways in which oppression itself can act. Not simply the, the possible strategies of the uh, oppressor, but also of the, also of the oppressed. Um, the other very important thing that we found was that, especially when we're talking about sexuality or we're talking about uh, violence, experience of violence, etc., etc., uh, there's one way of expressing something which is, uh, you know, which many of us uh, might be, uh, especially queer folk on on whom there has been research, are quite familiar with is when you're sitting with an inter you know you're sitting as an interviewee and then you're asked to tell the narrative of your coming out or the kind of uh, discrimination you faced etc and there's a certain way in which you tell the story which builds towards a certain kind of victim narrative or a certain kind of uh, there's a certain kind of telling which has its own restrictions um, and where, whereby the desire of the person for instance the desire of the of the oppressed has to be obliterated, has to be uh, ignored from the telling of that, of that narrative. Uh, there are several things which cannot articulate in a spoken, in a spoken narrative, in a spoken interview, uh, which, which is not first and foremost supported by a, uh, or emerging from a larger kind of process. So what we found really interesting and very compelling and, and sometimes difficult and intense was that this process of developing a forum uh, enable people to, to articulate, to experience, to share and to talk about things that could not otherwise be said. Things that cannot be captured in that realm of, of words which is uh, in, you know, right on top in that hierarchy were suddenly, uh, you know, were suddenly articulated. And, and you come up with a far more nuanced understanding of your conditions of being, of, of collective experiences of discrimination, of, of violence, uh, uh, etc. Et so there's a range of, of possibilities that are opened up. The minute we move away from the traditional notion of, uh, of theatre, the distance between uh, what is on stage and the people, and the, the, the audience, uh, and where uh, art becomes of the audience itself. It remains within that idiom. It may step out and there may be a policy maker. So, uh, Boal's notion of legislative theatre or his practice of legislative theatre, uh, you know, gets to that boundary where it's the policy maker, the policy space that is being engaged through the, through the forum. Uh, another very exciting thing is, is invisible theatre, where, for instance, you, you stage something in a public space without announcing that this is a performance. And you see how people respond to that and then you bring them into a, into a conversation. So there's a range of things that can be done. The minute we think uh, of art as a, as, a, as a social reality rather than focusing on the sovereignty of the artist or the intention of the artist. Uh, where, where art is already in, uh, in the realm of, 
of uh, political experience and political subjectivity and is not speaking to it from the, from the outside. Uh, if we extend this kind of an approach to other forms, so the, the more interactive kind of forms or, or where you have, you have graffiti where people can, can add to, can subtract, can do all sorts of other things, that, that object of art becomes a living space of contestation, of the development of political practice, discourse and, uh, and, and subjectivity. So if you think about, uh, about the way in which art, the, the potential of art for politics and in particular unruly politics where you're, you're trying to break the, the, the boundaries through which, uh, um, you know, or the language through which politics is understood and negotiated. I mean, I think it's, it's immense, but it requires the, the letting go of, uh, of the sovereignty of the, of the actor, of the, of the playwright, um, etc. So now finally let's get into uh, the theoretical frame of Jacques uh, Rossier. Um, I'm not going to get into it in too much detail because a lot of what we have already discussed assumes Rossier and you've already got a, a, a sense of the implications of his theoretical frame. Uh, what I'm going to do is try and make the theory more, more tangible and more, uh, uh, you know, more, more clear to you. Um, the first notion which I think uh, is probably Rossier's most important contribution to, to thinking is the idea of the distribution of the sensible. Now the sensible is that which we can say and see and hear, say and think, uh, that which can be, can be done and can be, can be made. Now it's not that all objects in the world can automatically be sensed, can automatically be seen or, or heard. There are certain conditions under which objects can be, uh, can be experienced or things uh, can, be, uh, can be experienced. Uh, and there are, these conditions are, according to Rossier, uh, uh, governed by certain a priori laws. So there are certain, you know, so what are the conditions under which something can actually be heard as intelligible and not simply sound like animal noises? Uh, what, what, you know, what, what is it that uh, enables us to see an object as an intel intelligible thing. Uh, the second important element of this notion of the distribution of the sensible is who can say, who can speak, who can, uh, can create those objects in the realm of the, of the sensible. So on the one hand you have the what can be sensed, what can be experienced through the senses and then you have the who participates in the creation of these things, who participates in the, uh, in the experiencing of these things. So the distribution of the sensible is a combination of what can be sensed and who can sense. Now this brings us to his notion of politics. His notion of politics is as an intervention into this distribution of the sensible. Into, on the one hand, what can be sensed. Right? It's, it's politics to him is about bringing in Onto, onto the stage new objects, bringing in new, new subjects, new, new things that can be, can be sensed. It's the, 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 the transformation of what used to be just noise into actual sound which can be, can be experienced and made sense of. Right? It's the, the emergence of, of new things in the realm of the sensible. Uh, and the second element is of course about who can create these objects how these objects can, uh, can emerge in, in, in the realm. So, so politics for Rossier is already an aesthetic practice. It is already an intervention into the distribution of the sensible, into the laws of what can be sensed and who can create uh, the, uh, these things of sense. So on the one hand, you have the aesthetics of politics. Right? And on the other, you have the politics of, uh, of aesthetics. So if the, if the aesthetics of, uh, of politics is about what can be sensed. The politics of aesthetics is who can sense, what are the conditions uh, uh, of, uh, of the creation of the, of the sensible. So for him, politics is the reframing of these relationships uh, between time and space, between objects and subjects, between uh, you know, th those questions of power, of, of who speaks and who listens, etc. And this leads us to the third and final thing that we're going to 
refer to, which is his idea of the three regimes of, uh, of art. Uh, the first regime is the ethical regime uh, of, of art, where uh, the value of art is seen in terms or, or something is, is art as long as it has value, as long as it uh, has a certain kind of, uh, of, of, of meaning within the already existing status quo of, uh, of politics. The second is the representational uh, regime of, uh, of art. And this is, kind of, I mean, the typical thing would be the statist kind of, uh, you know, the image of, uh, of, of Modi being, being uh, exercised and shown all over the, or you know, the large statues of the overpowering patriarch, that kind of thing, a certain representation of the status quo, the representation of, uh, of power as it already stands. It's kind of the reinforcement of, uh, of the already existing distribution of the sensible. And the third is where we get to, uh, to his notion of politics and to unruly politics itself, and that is the aesthetic regime of politics. That is precisely where it's not simply uh, the question of, of shaking up the, the positions from which people engage in, in a relationship, but the very possibility that, uh, you know, of, of challenging the, 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 the structure of, of that hierarchy, the, you know, challenging the, the existence of that, of that structure. So opening up that question of who can make interventions into aesthetics and who cannot, whose art counts, whose articulations or whose interventions into uh, the realm of the, of the sensible, right, enters and shakes up that distribution of the sensible, the, the laws that control and condition the realm of the, of the sensible. So finally, let's look at what this means in terms of, of unruly politics. Uh, we've already spoken in terms of you know, the various examples that we've, uh, that we've taken. How does, uh, how does art and uh, politics as aesthetics seek to change the way we experience the world itself? If there is a certain organization of objects and a certain, within a certain, a certain hierarchy, uh, there is the idea of high art and, and you know, the, the popular culture sort of, uh, sort of thing and you've got those who can speak politics and those whose, uh, whose, whose speech is simply the mumblings on the, uh, or, you know, or the murmurs on the street. Right? Unruly politics or uh, politics as aesthetics is precisely about turning that around and coming up with a notion of, of, of a horizontal Kind of, kind of space where all sorts of objects, all sorts of experiences of objects can rearrange uh, uh, aesthetics, can rearrange that distribution. So it's, it's precisely about taking over spaces, making people uh, experience, uh, experience the structures of power through their, through their, uh, their senses. That is kind of the challenge uh, that uh, many of the unruly ruptures uh, take on and take on uh, very uh, very well. So Tahrir Square, or you take any of the the squares which have been taken over and occupied, tend to have these huge statues. Tend to have the 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 you know the, the icons, the symbols of the state and the the hierarchical relationship with the state. The taking over of those spaces undermines precisely precisely that. So you have the you know the graffiti which is written or painted onto. Uh, onto those statues. You have the reclaiming of that space as, um, as being of the people, as articulating different political impulses, etc. So look at the various uh, unruly ruptures, the various forms of, of unruly action. Think about the clowns that we have spoken about. Uh, think about the ways in which uh, there's, there are memes, there's the use of technology for the appropriation of the uh, of the aesthetic, uh, the recasting of uh, status quoist representation into a new way of thinking about politics, into our ability to recognize the truth of power. That is the relationship between aesthetics, art and politics.